Twim listeners, do you have science you want to share? Microworld.org is the best place to post your microbiology-related news articles, pictures, videos, papers, and more. Sign up for a free account at microbeworld.org slash join and start reaching thousands of microbiology enthusiasts just like yourself. This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 85 recorded on August 14th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hi there. How Hi, are you? Vincent, and everybody. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Everything is peachy in San Diego. Very nice. <laughs> what does it mean to be peachy? Well, you know, except for that we have a drought, otherwise it's paradise. But the drought is significant yeah, and yes. worrisome, yep. extremely worrisome. Yeah. I thought it meant that you were actually getting into peach season in California. <laughs> Peachy. Also joining us from Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hi, Vincent. Well, Hello, everyone else. Peachy there where you are in Charlotte. No, no, we're in watermelon season right now. Yesterday's paper had a story about these heritage watermelons. For those of you too old, too young to remember, watermelons used to have seeds. So this heritage watermelon, they're actually making into brandy and they're pickling the watermelon rinds. And <laughs> so it's watermelon season here in Charleston. Watermelons. Wow. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How are you doing out there? Doing well. Is it uh, peachy or watermelony? It is peachy. We have we grow a lot of fruit in Michigan, and peaches are among the fruit that we grow. So yeah, peaches excellent. and cherries. Have you been working on your golf game this summer? I have, but not as much as I might like. Yeah. Um, I had the privilege and pleasure of chairing a Gordon conference um, in July. So that oh, was is that over. Um, oh, I yeah. didn't know it was in July. Yeah, yeah, that went real Good well, but. Um, what was it on? Was, it's called microbial toxins and patho pathogenicity. Hmm. Oh boy, so there is a subject. Michelle, yep. if you had your, if you could do whatever you wanted, would you golf every day? Probably not every day. If I were better, I might want to golf every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's no sport that I would want to do every day. Right. I don't do any sports actually. I do virology. Is that, is that is not a sport, though? It's an adventure. <laughs> Speaking of virology, um, if I don't know if our, our listeners are interested in viruses, but there's a, an outbreak of Ebola virus disease <laughs> ongoing in Africa, which everyone knows don't about. Don't insult our, our listeners. I'm sure everybody is aware of that. Um, and um, I don't know how much overlap there is between TWIM and TWIV listeners. Oh, but Ebola, everybody is talking about Ebola. Yeah. So we talked about it for two hours on TWIV last week. So TWIV 297. Yeah, I listen to it. I learned a lot. Um, you know what I have come to realize? That this disease is a product of poor health, poor government, and cultural issues in a very specific country or set of countries. And it wouldn't happen anywhere else probably. You know, these infections should not proceed through the population. They only do so because of, of, of difficulties and not here, for example, it would probably not be anything. So, so the index case would be detected early and they yeah. would contain it? That's right. Mm -hmm. So this whole outbreak, over 8, 1,700 infections, started in February, one transfer from some forest animal to a human. It was a single transfer, which then spread through humans. You know, very close contact. But I, yes, you're right, Michelle, that would not happen here because it would be detected, the person would be treated and isolated mm -hmm. properly. Treated is a bit uh, optimistic, isn't it? Well, you know, I you spoke to a physician. I, I Maybe cared yes. for. Cared for. Cared for. Maybe. I spoke to a physician last week who does a lot of field work, and he said the reason the Ebola patients die is because they become dehydrated, mm. and they, they don't give them sufficient fluids by intravenous. And, like cholera. Uh, like cholera. So uh, here in the U.S., that would probably not be a problem. The mortality rate, would, the case fatality rate would be lower, and it wouldn't spread. 
I, Plus, I also, we would give them platelets too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I read in the New York Times coverage that um, it was unfortunate that that index case was at an area that um, has got now better transportation and near a border. Yeah. And so there's just a lot more people flowing That's right. through that region and that contributed to the spread. And so, if, uh, also, yeah. these three countries, never four countries, never experienced Ebola hemorrhagic mm-hmm. disease before. They have no experience with it, you know. So take a place like Uganda where they have seen it before. They are really improving. Uganda actually has a BSL-4 laboratory now. So they, okay. can, they can diagnose wow. infection and they can start to treat. Their case fatality ratio is now around 40%. Uh, so it's dropped. And so that I, I really think this is an unusual disease that's a product of a, a confounding of uh, incidents. So... Anyway, go over to TWIV. You can listen to that. I also wanted to mention one other issue, which I think touches all microbiologists and perhaps others as well. If some of you may know, there has been a lot of discussion in the past couple of years about what are called gain-of-function experiments. This started with gain-of-function is nothing new. Anyone who does genetics knows that we do this all the time. We give genes and organisms new properties. But uh, giving influenza H5N1 virus the ability to transmit by aerosol among ferrets is a particular gain-of-function experiment that got a lot of people scared. And a number of individuals have been saying now that we shouldn't be doing these with influenza virus, that it's too dangerous. We risk uh, infecting the world and killing a lot of people and so forth. And I want to just point out a very nice editorial in MBio by Mike Imperiali and from the University of Michigan. Go blue. <laughs> and Arturo Casadeval, you all know as well, uh, which attempts to explain what's been going on. There are now two groups of people. Uh, there's a group called the Cambridge Working Group, which uh, came together a few months ago and are calling for a moratorium or a cutback on gain of function experiments. This is Cambridge, England. No, it's just Cambridge, Massachusetts, I uh-huh. think. And um, the same group that started it in the past. That's right. Well, maybe. So I don't like the dogmatic position of the Cambridge Working Group. I think they use a lot of misinformation and fear mongering. So I started another group together with Paul Dupre of Boston University called Scientists for Science. And we've managed to collect uh, nearly 100 signatures there, scientistsforscience.org. And all this is explained in the MBio article. I mean, in the end, we feel that these experiments need to be done to understand pathogens. They can be done safely. And we're happy to have a a dialogue about this. So Cambridge Working Group has called for a a a Silomar-like moment for gain-of-function experiments. And we just say, okay, if that's necessary, it needs to be done in a neutral place like the National Academy of Sciences, maybe the American Society for Microbiology. Some neutral body has to do this and not one group or the other. And that's, mm. that's uh, what Good we're proposing. Idea. So you can find all those links at the uh, MBio uh, article. I'll put the link to that in the show notes. All right, let's get on to science here or at least a paper. And I would like to go first if, if uh, you guys don't mind. And the paper I'm going to talk about today is a paper published uh, in Science, July 11th, 2014. And it is called Multispecies Diel Transcriptional Oscillations in Open Ocean Heterotrophic Bacterial Assemblages. And a lot of new words there we'll have to think about. The uh, authors are Otteson, Young, Gifford, Epley, Marin, Schuster, Scholin, and DeLong. This is a pretty neat paper, um, which is kind of new for us. I don't think we talk very much about um, environmental microbiology. We have a few times in the past, but not a lot. We tend to focus on disease and disease-causing microbes, but there are a lot out there that do very interesting things for the earth. And that's what this paper is about. Uh, Actually, I must tell you, uh, <laughs> no, I I have to salute you uh, for doing this because this is not your usual bailiwick. As yeah. Everybody knows you're a virologist, and here you are doing really bacterial stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, it shows you there is a 
science is, microbiology is an integrative science. And you know, virologists can talk about bacteria and vice versa. Absolutely. I That's love this. Good. I think this is very great. Nice. I think the environmental micro. I know there are also people who study the viruses in the ocean, and I love that as well. That's right. So, I mean, this required some learning for me, but I like to learn, and I feel that as a scientist, I can learn anything. Now, I may I may make mistakes, and that's why you guys are around. And uh, you can tell me, no, Vincent, that's not right. Okay, so here, uh, a ge- first of all, um, a diel, everyone should know that diel is something involving a 24-hour period. That's one of the words in the title, okay? It's the same as circa- circadian. Circadian, diel, it's a different root, I guess. Uh, yeah. Um, now, a heterotroph is an organism that can't fix carbon, but it uses carbon for growth. And what they want to do in this paper is to look at these bacterial communities uh, in, in the ocean and start to figure out the relationship between them. And in particular, they're looking at what's called the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, G-Y-R-E. Now, gyre is a system of rotating ocean currents. And I'll put a picture in the show notes of this North uh, Pacific subtropical gyre, which turns out to be the largest contiguous ecosystem on the planet. It's huge. It spans the entire Pacific. You You got the Hawaiian archipelago right in the middle. And then there are all sorts of currents that go from Japan to California and a little bit. And then north of these, there's Alaskan currents and Bering Strait currents as well. Now here, <clears throat> the surface waters in these gyres don't have a lot of nutrients in them. And that's a good reason to study these. You're kind of away from the coasts where organic stuff is always pouring into the ocean from land masses. So you go out to the Hawaiian area. It's not, not a lot of nutrients. And so the bacteria there have evolved. There's not a lot of diversity in uh, the, the microorganisms that live in these surface waters. And they've evolved to help each other, as you'll see from this paper. A major species in these water is a cyanobacteria called Prochlorococcus. Lots and lots of these uh, in these surface waters. And these guys undergo photosynthesis. They use light uh, to make organic compounds. They also produce oxygen uh, in the process. Uh, And they make a, a lot of the organic matter that other bacteria use to grow on. Because, again, these waters are nutrient poor. And some of these other bacteria, the Pelagibacter is another one of them. We'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about. So Prochlorococcus is one of the main players here. It's probably the most abundant photosynthetic organism on the planet. It's a primary producer. It makes organic compounds using light. It makes 50% of atmospheric oxygen. Wow. I mean, this is amazing. That's a big number. I mean, without these guys, gals and guys, we would be in big trouble. (laughs) We don't have enough land to plant trees if it wasn't for this particular species to maintain our oxygen in our atmosphere. It's incredible. It's incredible. So you got Prochlorococcus, which is the primary producer. They make compounds and the other bacteria that are using them, this is the community. And they want to see the gene expression patterns between the Prochlorococcus and the other bacteria, okay? So that's the question. And the key here is a really interesting technological advance, which is a a free-drifting robotic environmental sample processor. So these are things that are floating. You could if you if you've seen the boys out in the ocean floating there, they're they're like that except they're they're about twenty meters below the surface, and they're connected with a cable to a buoy and a flag that's floating, so you know where they are. And these are free floating; they migrate with the currents, and the currents are pretty constant, so they're always more or less in the same pattern. And there, there are a bunch of these out there, and you can get time on them. And what they do is they will collect samples from the ocean. So this, the one they used for this study was at 23 meters deep, and you can specify the size because they'll filter the water through a, a filter. And here they use 0.2 to 5 micron size fraction. 
So they say everything between 0.2 and 5 microns. These are pretty small uh, bacteria, I understand, these uh, prochlorococcus. They are. And um, they collect the sample every two hours for three days as the robot is moving with the currents. All right, and then you go with a boat out to it <laughs> and you get your samples. <laughs> this is just great. It stores them. It stores them in separate filters. It's automated. And you take all your filters that are labeled in some way as to which, what sequence they're in, and then you bring them back to the lab and you can process them uh, however you and want. And it's the, um, the machine is also set up so that as soon as the tiny bacteria are collected on the filter, then they treat them with a fix right. to preserve the RNA. It's amazing. Yep. It's just incredible. Uh, so then they took these back to the lab. Basically, they wanted to look at the transcriptome, the RNA produced by transcription of DNA templates and compare them, all right? So they extracted the RNA from these samples. They convert it to cDNA using reverse transcriptase. And then they sequence the DNA. Uh, hold on. I, maybe we should explain for the sake of mm -hmm. some newcomers that uh, the reason for doing transcriptomes versus genomes is that the genome is sort of a static measurement of what DNA is there. Whereas the transcriptome tells you what DNA has been transcribed, in other words, is actually working right. into messenger RNA. So it's a different measurement and one which tells you more about what's going on than just what is there. Right. So we want to we want to compare gene activity over time. You know, how, are, how is gene expression exactly. changing as these uh, bacteria experience the day passing and so forth? It's a three-day experiment. All right, so you, you sequence it and you can see right away what is on and what is off. And so basically they find that the, the DNA sequences they get are dominated by RNAs from prochlorococcus, as we would expect, because that's the, a big um, community member out there in these surface waters. And other bacteria like Pelagibacter and Roseobacter. These are proteorhodopsin-containing bacteria. Proteorhodopsin is sort of like rhodopsin. It's a light-driven pump in the membrane that pumps protons and makes a gradient uh, and uses that gradient to synthesize organic compounds. So they're, they're also doing photosynthesis, but these bacteria are proto photoheterotrophic. They can't uh, just use carbon dioxide as a carbon source. They need other organic compounds. So uh, these other bacteria, besides the prochlorococcus, need to get some nutrients as well, and in addition to what they're making by photosynthesis. And again, the, the waters are nutrient poor, so they depend on the prochlorococcus to get these nutrients. So again, the transcripts are dominated by these prochlorococcus and pelagibacter and roseobacter. So here are the findings, which are really, really interesting. First of all, the transcriptional activity of prochlorococcus is dependent on the time of day. About half of the transcripts are periodic and they peak uh, either at dawn or at dusk, all right? And that's probably not surprising because this is a photosynthesizing uh, organism and so things are going to turn on or off depending on whether it's day or night. Although it's amazing that they could collect that information <laughs> from the open ocean. Right. Yeah, so that's really actually, impressive. that brings up an interesting point that I'll talk about later. They've actually done similar experiments in the lab. There, there's a, a strain of prochlorococcus that you can grow in the laboratory, and you can give it light and dark and cycle it and measure gene ex activity, and uh, I'll talk about the results later. Okay, Roseobacter, one of these community members that depends on prochlorococcus. They also showed strong daily oscillations in the transcriptome, especially the genes involved in photosynthesis. Now remember, when you look at a transcriptome, that is all the RNAs that are being transcribed, you can say, okay, this gene is involved in metabolism or photosynthesis, protein synthesis, transcription. You can put it into groups. And in these roseobacters, the trans most of the transcripts peak during the daylight hours. And this, was, this includes ribosomal protein transcripts, respiratory transcripts, uh, genes involved in amino acid metabolism, and transporters all right, during the daylight hours. So the idea being that it's probably they're using the metabolites produced by the prochlorococcus, and these genes are turned on in order to do that. For about 40 genes from this roseobacter peak during the night. 
And these were genes that are identified as part of a photosynthesis operon. And so they're like, wow, why is this going on at night? Because there's no light. Well, maybe it's to get ready. As soon as that sun pops up in the morning, then every, all the genes are turned on and ready to start doing photosynthesis. Um, there's uh, also, so again, these other bacteria, the, the Pelagibacter and the Roseobacter, they have diel periodicity um, uh, a daily, on a daily basis. And, that, and that's actually the big surprise, isn't it? Yeah, the other ones, right? Yeah, yeah. That's all the point of this paper is to show that, uh, I mean, the, the periodicity was well known in photosynthesizers and well studied, but uh, the heterotrophic bacteria should have that is really news. Right. Now, these, these other bacteria do some photosynthesis themselves. They have the proteorhodopsin, and those transcripts peak near dawn. So just before dawn, they peak, which is, I guess, again, ready for them to start doing photosynthesis. Uh, there's a co nice correlation of the transcripts in, in the other bacteria, the non-prochlorococcus, with the light-driven behavior of the prochlorococcus. So prochlorococcus peaks in photosynthetic activity, and then these other bacteria have a succession of translational, transcriptional, and respiratory gene transcripts. Okay, so in other words, prochlorococcus the light comes out, it fixes carbon by photosynthesis, releases the carbon into the water, and then the other microbes respond to that and turn on the genes that they need to utilize these organic compounds. So prochlorococcus uses about 75% of what it makes. It's a good community member. It puts 25% out there in the water, <laughs> and these other bacteria are using it. So they call this a very nice phrase from the I think this was from the uh, analysis paper that accompanies it. An exquisite coupling of waves of gene expression across different types of bacteria. And in fact, there's a nice um, analysis by Virginia Armbrust. It's called Taking the Pulse of Ocean Microbes, which is a nice little play on the words because, of course, these genes are going on and off in pulses. So these two bacteria, are, I would say, are dancing, right, together. One's making, the other's using. So how does this work? Um, well, clearly photoreceptors are most likely involved in, in regulating light-dark cycles of transcription. That's been shown before in the, in the lab, but there's something else as well. Um, probably this tight metabolic coupling, all right? So the primary producers, the, the um, prochlorococcus, they make the organic compounds, and then the consumers detect them. And then that turns on a wave of, of genes that the consumers need in order to use those compounds. And so figuring out uh, what the signals are and how they're sensed is really going to be part of the next series of experiments. And they've generated a lot of data uh, in these experiments, and probably that could be mined more to figure out what genes are going on and what they do, they note that a lot of the genes that are regulated in this experiment have no known function. You know, you look at them and you say, we have no idea what this does. So it could be that some of those are involved in this coupling between the primary producers and the, the consumers. Uh, Vincent, can I ask you a question? Mm. Um, you, it's easy to see what uh, this uh, arrangement does for the uh, consumers. Yeah. But what does it do for the prochlorococcus? That's Why a great question. <laughs> Certainly not altruistic. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's a, you know, this is a debate in uh, in evolution whether altruism is a selected phenotype or not. And this is clearly altruistic. I don't know. Maybe they make an excess, and um, that excess has attracted consumers. You know, it's the same with people. A lot of people make a lot of money, and they don't need it all, and they kind of release it. <laughs> And other people followed them all over the place. <laughs> Hoping they dropped the nickels and dimes. Yeah. And I think it goes back to nickels and dimes. What the heterotrophs may be doing for the prochlorococcus, while it can generate all of its energy from mm. sunlight and get all of its carbon from CO2, it is in desperate need of metals and it's in desperate need of mm. phosphorus and it's in desperate need of things that the prochlorococcus may not uh, have in general abundance. And, you know, heterotrophs live and then they die. 
And so consequently, they could be some, nothing more than a sink mm, maybe, yeah. that will serve mm. as a, if you will, a, 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 a pantry from which the prochlorococcus can then draw essential nutrients that it needs to make more prochlorococcus. Yeah, that's oh, that idea. sounds very good. That I'm, I'm right. sure if you asked Ed DeLong, he would have, he would, he would yeah. ideas. I'm sure they have ideas yeah. about this, you know. But, um, yeah, I, I think this is a really neat story. So one last point here is comparing what they find in the open. So this is an open ocean experiment. And, again, to emphasize, they, this is done around Hawaii because it's far away from the big land masses that dump things into the ocean. And it might cloud the results. Can you imagine if some, some organic compounds are running off from the land into the ocean? That would turn on the gene expression pattern of – uh, these consumers, in a way that might not make sense with the light. So things the are different in New Jersey, aren't they, Vincent? Things are very different <laughs> in New Jersey, yes. <laughs> we throw a lot of organic stuff in the ocean. Well, more importantly, things have really taken a turn for the worse in Toledo. We just have to read the most recent events about the algal blooms yes. in Toledo yes. making the, toxins. The lake. Yeah, making yeah. toxins. Yeah. So the other aspect here is that this transcriptional pattern is, is reminiscent of some findings that were made using a cultured strain of prochlorococcus in the lab given cycles of light and dark. Okay, so there are differences to be sure. And one of them is interesting. A subset of genes that cycle in the ocean is missing from the lab strain. So you don't, it's not even there at all. So clearly the ocean population has a lot more genetic diversity than the strain that's being used in the lab. But the point here is that justify you, you can learn something from studying some of these strains in the lab, but you still need to go out into the field and uh, and study it there as well. So I, I just like these these microbiological experiments where you go out and you sample and you do an intelligent experiment. I think you can learn so much without and perturbing the system. Exactly, you're trying not to perturb it. Yeah. That- so it's observational in a sense, but you are depending on the the diurnal. Right, the daily oscillations here in, in light and dark to um, make the, the variability in, in the experiment, the variations, right. right? You don't do it yourself, but you depend on nature. And you made it sound very elegant, but I, I had a chance to talk with uh, Liz Ottenson, who's the primary author, or the first author on this paper, and she told me a little bit more about the experience of, of doing this work. So there's this large ship that uh, has um, a team of 16 to 20 different scientists from different groups working on different projects. They have three or four instruments um, that they are launching off this ship. Um, she described it was, uh, it took a little bit of um, convincing to, um, to get the owners of the instruments to agree to dangle them freely from a buoy. These are half million dollar instruments <laughs> <laughs> and have them just go with the current and the wind. Yeah. Um, so it was a little bit nerve wracking um, at first. And, um, and as Michael was saying, um, he was commenting on the, um, the, the problem recently in Lake Erie off the coast of Toledo, uh, where they had blooms of cyanobacterium because they make toxins. Um, Liz told me that that was one of the um, early uses of these instruments. They're designed to um, use PCR and, and ELISA assays automated in these um, instruments that float in the water mm. to collect this information in real time and give us information um, that's important for uh, water purity and, and human health, um, as we saw in the Toledo case. But um, it, it just sounded like a, a really cool project. So even though she did most of her work at MIT, she was able to spend uh, three weeks in Hawaii on this vessel. Mm. Um, and not only did she have this experiment going where the the robot collected samples every two hours, but she then at the same time was manually collecting water every four hours for a different project. Oh, oh <laughs> so it was, uh, it was quite an enterprise. That's cool. So yeah. she, went, she went out on this ship. That's right. Wow. And I guess these, when they release these collectors they do have some kind of radio thing on so they can find them right right and then but also just an old-fashioned deep- rope um <laughs> as a backup <laughs> wow so it's pretty cool yeah so what, Liz what's, is now an assistant professor at um university of georgia in athens mm-hmm. where she's continuing this and some related work um on uh the impact of microbes in the environment on um air quality and water quality nice well thank you that's cool 
Nice to go out on the ship. I was talking to Curtis Suttle a couple of weeks ago who does similar stuff looking for viruses in the sea. You have to, these ships are you know, leased by companies because they're too expensive to have your own. Right. And you have to get time on it. He said it's very competitive. <laughs> and then there are multiple independent groups on the ship at the same time. That's so right. What, a, what an interesting environment. Yeah. Yeah, that could be interesting, wouldn't it? You know, virologists and microbiologists. Well, it's sort of a time. floating Gordon conference. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I should point out for this particular project, it was a collaboration between the group at MIT, um, also uh, people at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and then the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education. Um, and they have a website that we can put on the show notes that shows um, a describes a number of the instruments uh, that they are able to drop down into the ocean to collect this information. It's cool. It's very cool. Technology here is great. Yeah. And of course, the computational biology, yeah. the statistics that you need, um, it's really an interdisciplinary uh, pursuit. Nice. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. I have a second paper here and Michael will be talking about this one. Okay. Um, this manuscript is entitled Extensively Drug Resistant, or XDR, Pseudomonas Originosa Containing the BLA, VIM2, and Elements of Salmonella Genomic Island 2, a New Genetic Resistance Determinant in Northeast Ohio. And this paper is literally ripped from the headlines. Uh, and the headlines that we've been seeing out in the news media is Pseudomonas superbug found in Ohio. Now, all of this seems with the recent hype about the Ebola outbreak, it, it almost portends to the beginning of a bad zombie movie, uh, but it's not. Uh, this particular paper that I elected to highlight this week is about this microbe that is not new to us. We've talked about Pseudomonas in the past, but the traits this particular one is carrying is what the cause of all the fuss is about. This microbe is one that every first time microbiologist has worked with in class, Pseudomonas originosa. It's great as an unknown for it's really easy to ID because it's modal and it produces a nice pigment because it makes pyocyanin. Um, and when I was trained in the last century, I was taught that this bug is extremely versatile. Uh, and we were to consider that this particular genus was metabolically remarkable. And what that meant to us in microbial physiology is that it was able to mineralize or reduce everything to the base element, CO2 and water, just simply by encountering it. And I guess if you had to look at a trait that Pseudomonas was most often associated with, it's really its microbial infallibility. We can almost feed anything to Pseudomonas and it will just eat it. And in today's paper, uh, which will appear in the October issue of the ASM journal Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, and the authors are Federico Perez, Hoja, Marshall, Ray, Rather, uh, Swantarat, uh, Dumford, O'Shea, uh, Damatravic, uh, Salada, Cavada, Chen, Chrysworth, Villa, Hausler, Jacobs, and Bonomo. Uh, this is a, a very large group of, of 17 scientists. And again, ripped from the headlines, this work was conducted at a VA institution, uh, principally the research services from the Lewis Stokes Cleveland Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center in, in Cleveland, Ohio. So this is a really um, neat piece of work. And uh, they describe the isolation of this extensively drug-resistant uh, pseudomonas containing this particular um, integron. And before I get into the specifics of the paper, I'm going to give you some background that will actually hopefully help you appreciate why I consider this a twimmable uh, event. Uh, some of you have likely heard of this catchphrase 20 by 2020, or which is simply the need that this country has realized that we need 20 new antibiotics by 2020 if we are 
to continue in the lifestyle that we've grown accustomed. And similarly, there's uh, another initiative called the Longitude Prize for 2014, and they are principally asking for the same thing, where in this case of the Longitude Prize, they are offering a 10 million pound prize to tackle the glowing, growing levels of antibi- antimicrobial resistance. And the challenge that the longitudinal group is putting out there is to create a cost-effective, accurate, rapid, and easy-to-use test for bacterial infections that will allow health professionals uh, worldwide to administer the right antibiotics at the right time. So uh, the BLAVIM2 integron is actually uh, carrying a gene that uh, cleaves beta-lactam antibiotics, specifically the carbapenems, which were the last mainstay for the treatment of infections caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And as the name implies, beta-lactamase, the carbapenems are an advanced beta-lactam antibiotic whose structure beyond the beta-lactam ring makes them highly resistant to beta-lactamases. And many of you already know that the beta-lactamase, which is an enzyme that cleaves the penicillin class of antibiotics, is a diffusible product from the microbe. So the microbe makes this enzyme, it secretes it, it goes out into the medium where it destroys the antibiotic in, in, in the location that the microbe is actually living. And this antibiotic, uh, the carbapenem, is a naturally derived product from uh, Streptomyces. So another microbe makes this antibiotic as part of its normal life history. And uh, carbapenems were originally brought to market because of the multi-drug resistance that we were seeing emerge in things like E. coli and Klebsiella and, of course, Pseudomonas. And recently, there has been an alarm raised over the spread of drug resistance of, of carbapenem antibiotics. And we did a um, uh, ICAC live on this a few years ago where we had the expert from Britain uh, specifically talk about the metallo beta-lactamase or the MBL that is uh, scaring everyone out there. You probably heard it referred to as the New Delhi metallo beta-lactamase or NDM1. And the CDC, of course, has made this a priority by declaring war on Cree, which is the carbapenemase resistant Enterobacteraceae, where they declared war on, if you will, an entire family of microbes that actually are carrying this gene for beta-lactam destruction. So it's not an alien language. It's, it's nothing more than a very fancy gene that is being distributed or promiscuously transmitted um, around the globe. Now, the reason this is a take-home story and making the news in the United States is up until very recently, uh, the metallobetalactamase or MBLs were uncommon in the U.S. despite... Me, can I interrupt you for one sure. second? Sure. The word metallo, uh, you want to say why it's called that? It or needs a call? metal in order to be active. Okay. And that will get to how these authors identified that this microbe actually had this particular gene. And it was really a clever trick in the medium. They uh, put the antibiotic in, a, uh, if you will, a paper disc... We've all probably played with the paper disc antibiotic uh, and the way that particular test works is you paint a lawn of bacteria on a Petri plate and then you deposit your antibiotic on a piece of filter paper and then you deposit the filter paper disc on the Petri plate. With agar in it. With (laughs) agar in it and the microbes grow up (laughs) and as the drug diffuses out of the filter paper via capillary action, the microbes can't grow there. And so you get a clear zone. And so the way the e-test works is the filter paper 
is designed to distribute a specific concentration of antibiotic. And what, um, and I have a picture of this for the show notes, and the way this modified e test works is there's imipenem, which is a carbapenem um, analog. There's imipenem in this e test plus and minus EDTA. And the way they determine whether or not this microbe actually has a metallo beta lactamase is they see a threefold um, difference in sensitivity to the antibiotic. So the metallo beta lactamase, where the metal is bound up by EDTA, um, is simply has a difference from the control that lacks the metal. So you chelate away the metal with the EDTA and, and you can see the difference. The picture is much better at, at illustrating this than, than my narrative. I, I haven't quite figured out how to describe that aspect of baseball uh, when it comes to the, to the E-test. So in this particular manuscript, they, deci- they described how they detected MBL producing uh, pseudomonas from uh, a, a group of community hospitals that are feeding into uh, the, the main unit in Northwest, or excuse me, Northeast Ohio. They asked the typical questions, uh, were there anything unique about the patients? And then they defined the resistance determinants. And what I found interesting is they described the structure of the genetic element harboring this beta-lactamase MBL. And they did this by the usual suspects. They did genome sequencing, and then they typed the MBL producing Pseudomonas aeruginosa by pulse pulse field gel electrophoresis, which we have described in the past, but the shorthand is you isolate chromosomal DNA, you subject it to a particular restriction enzyme that slices and dices the chromosome up, you deposit it in an agarose gel, and then you alter the electric field. It enables the large DNA to go into the gel, and you get the typical ladder that many of you are familiar with with uh, plasmid preps when you cut them with restriction enzymes. And to compare and contrast different microbes, they'll they if they have the same pulse field gel electrophoretic pattern, they are considered equivalent because you have a five megabase genome that you're slicing and dicing up with a particular enzyme. And if it has the same pattern, it's likely uh, very similar to one another. And typically the rule of thumb is if there's a three band uh, difference, they're, they're not equivalent. And if it's uh, greater than that, they are then uh, dissimilar. The other way they did it, and this is what I found um, really interesting because I hadn't thought about this up until this point in time is they use something called repetitive sequence PCR. And this is another cool technique to keep in your back pocket when you think about analyzing different communities. Prokaryotes and eukaryotes uh, genomes contain dispersed repetitive sequences separating longer single copy DNA sequences. And these interspread repetitive sequence are generally relatively short, less than 500 base pairs. So it makes it really ideal for PCR. And they're generally non-coding. This is always um, interesting because non-coding regions in a genome sort of have a selective disadvantage, but you can also stick DNA into them if they have the right particular homologous recombination site. But at the end of the day, what this repetitive sequence-based PCR will generate is a pattern because you get different size pieces depending upon which way your primers are pointing. So you'll get a set of bands, or if you will, you'll get a chromatographic image of peaks and that peak, it, that peak pattern is unique to that particular microbe. So, so you can almost use it to identify a microbe based on where these repetitive sequences are scattered across the circular chromosome. 
if you will, it's very similar to the type of analysis that is being done for Malditoff. Malditoff generates a particular pattern that then is recognized, and that's how Malditoff is revolutionizing diagnostic microbiology. It's basically the time of flight pattern that is resulting, and then that pattern is compared in order to get an identity. We're so, talking about like mass, mass spectrometry, right? It's, it's like fingerprinting, exactly, printing, Michelle. Yep. Yeah. And the final method that they use to ID these microbes as being unique is multilocus sequence typing. And multilocus sequence typing, I don't know if we've talked about in the past on TWIM, but it's really uh, a pretty straightforward technique and it involves housekeeping genes. Typically, seven housekeeping genes are sequenced um, and you get a particular sequence type. And they've used it to type everything from pneumonia strains to Neisseria strains to now Pseudomonas strains. So those are the three principal techniques that they're going to use to answer the questions about this genetic element. But before we get to the details, I just want to tell you um, a little bit about carbapenems. They have been amongst the most active antibiotics against Pseudomonas. And Pseudomonas, because of its microbial infallibility genome, it's able to resist anything that we throw at it, um, it's had a rough time adapting to the carbapenems, but it's only through this acquisition of new knowledge, these genes, that it's been able to do that. And, you know, people have said resistance to acquiring resistance is futile, to borrow an expression from uh, the Borg Collective from Star Trek. And this resistance in Pseudomonas is often most is often a result of the antibiotic mediated selection of mutants because you know you go back to the Shakespeare expression that what does not kill you makes you stronger and you're effectively selecting out uh, a class of organisms that are then resistant and this typically in Pseudomonas this is um, they selected mutants that uh, lost the OMPRD porin or they overexpress um, cephalosporinases, which is equivalent to a beta-lactamase, or they just simply engineer pumps to pump out the antibiotic uh, more effectively, putting out those beta-lactamases, or they simply pump out the drug. And so... The final thing is we know that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is very promiscuous. It likes to acquire new information via horizontal gene transmission. And whether that be uh, conjugation, whether it be the introduction of transposons, it loves mobile genetic elements. And the final thing we need to know before we get to the meat of the paper is we need to know about metallobetalactamases. And they are able to cleave this four-membered beta-lactam ring with the exception of the monobactams. And the monobactams, as the name implies, is just a four-member ring by itself. And then they have these big complicated uh, side chains. And the monobactams um, are, are, are really now our, our last line of defense, but MBLs um, – may be forecasting the end of them as well. So the metallobetalactamases are a global problem. We've already touched upon them as a consequence of um, medical tourism where they went from the streets of New Delhi all the way to Norway and then they have spread across the globe. And the one that's getting the greatest amount of attention is – is an MBL, so this is the gene, the metallobetalactamase that's within a Verona integron encoded beta-lactamase. And this Verona uh, integron is such that it is able to uh, have other genes in it and – it's been infrequent in the U.S. 
but it's increasing in its prevalence. We we talked last year, I think, about the outbreak at um, the NIH where they had to close a unit. And these integrons are, are these genetic units characterized by their ability to, to incorporate and capture uh, genetic cassettes by site-specific recombination. And these things, these integrons generally carry everything but a kitchen sink they're like be- flypaper, right? They, they're like flypaper. <laughs> they can catch anything. And they become huge to jump a little bit ahead. The one that they found was 34 kilobases in length. This is not your father's plasma. This, yeah. is, this is huge. And they um, – so they, they found in plasmas. They're found in transposons and they're found in chromosomes. And as you can well imagine, transposons move, plasmids add a selective burden to the, um, the organism. But if it's in the chromosome, it, it really is hard to, to get rid of. So the premise of this paper is really pretty straightforward. And they're reporting on the dissemination of Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates that contain this VIM2 integron from community hospitals in Northeast Ohio. And this particular integron confirmed resistance beyond MBL. Uh, it, it had everything in it. And the way they did this is they had a defined study period. They, they characterized over almost 4,000 single patient isolates of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then they asked how many were resistant to carbapenems? In highlighting the seriousness of this, 20% of the 4,000 isolates were resistant to carbapenem. And they further learned that seven strains out of these 4,000 were found to harbor this MBL determinant, which represented 1% of the carbapenem resistant pseudomonas. Now, the first case that they described was from a 69-year-old man with type 2 diabetes in a long-term care facility with an infected foot lesion. And that's where they got the pseudomonas containing MBL from. But the thing was, he was also asymptomatic with a urinary tract infection with the same drug-resistant variant of pseudomonas. And UTIs because of urine and if the microbe is in the urine stream, it can spread very easily. We've already described the modified um, EDTA uh, E-test, but they also characterize this using a modified Hodge test, which uh, detects, again, carbapenemase production in isolates of Enterobacteriaceae. And since Cree is such a a big thing. I thought I'd take a few seconds to tell you about the modified Hodge test because this, again, is is a really cool uh, lab demonstration that you can actually use to go out and characterize soil to see if you've got any of these carbapenemase-resistant creatures. And the way this particular test works, again, you start with an auger plate and you put a lawn of E. coli that's resistant to carbapenems and you put the drug in and remember that uh, this metallo carbapenemase is a diffusible product. And so you put the disc down and you then put your isolates on and if the MBL is present in your isolate, what will happen is it will inactivate the disc or the beta-lactam drug that's within that zone that prevents the growth of the E. coli. And you end up with this beautiful clover leaf-like pattern on the Petri plate. So it's a really easy visual way of figuring out whether or not your microbe has a particular gene. No PCR, this is truly beautiful low tech. And as I said, the EDTA MBL test 
uh, EDTA chelates the metals and you need the metal in order for this to work. So they then did all their fancy molecular typing. Um, they typed with this rep PCR and they revealed that all of the isolates that had the MBL in it shared greater than 95% similarity. And from the pulse field, they revealed six of the nine isolates were closely related. Uh, that is to say they had less than a three band uh, difference. And the MLST pattern classified all the isolates at sequence type 233, which sim and the way they classify with MLST is they just look at um, particular multi-locus sequence typing. Yeah. Multi-locus. And so, and then the PCR detected MBL producing isolates while other carbapenemase genes were um, absent. They then asked the question, could they easily transfer the genes from Pseudomonas to something else? And they were unsuccessful, which is suggesting that perhaps these genes are, are stuck on, on the chromosome. And what they then, doing whole gene, genome sequencing, is um, they found uh, the hallmarks of where these things are integrating into into the chromosome. And it, it, it reads like GPS coordinates. Uh, a 3.2 kilobase TN402 integron fragment was isolated from all the isolates. And you then begin to see what this integron has in it. And the integron had in it two aminoglycoside modifying enzymes. And aminoglycosides are in a different class of antimicrobial than beta-lactamases. Beta-lactamase targets cell wall. Aminoglycosides target uh, uh, protein synthesis indirectly by affecting uh, the ribosomes. And then they, again, confirmed everything by Western blots looking for this VIM um, uh, MBL and they found that the beta-lactamase, uh, the metallo-beta-lactamase was produced as at similar levels. They then went on to look at the structure of this genomic island. It, and here's where they found out it was 30, almost 35,000 base pairs in length, harboring 37 open reading frames. So it goes back to what Michelle said is that this is like fly paper. And it was present in the chromosome with a, a gene encoding the phosphate ABC transport substrate binding protein. And the recombinant element carried uh, not only resistant to beta-lactams, but aminoglycosides, tetracycline, corn phenicol, trimethoprim, antiseptics, sulfonamides, and mercury. So you can wow. now see why it carries the moniker uh, extremely drug resistant or extensively drug resistant this and alarmingly the xdr phenotype expressed by these isolates precluded any reliable antibiotic treatment since they even displayed intermediate resistant to colistatin which is used in europe but only is used as an agent of last resort in the u.s because this is an old antibiotic from ancient times that clinicians in the U.S. don't use all that often, and it requires tremendous uh, clinical skill to administer to patients because is it toxic? Uh, toxic it, or something? It's toxic. Yeah. Did all these people die, uh, Michael? Uh, no, some lived, but some died. So, so even though the antibiotics don't work, you can still survive these infections, right? You can still survive these infections. Hmm. And then they go on to characterize the epidemiological link among these genetic related isolates. And it appears to be the admission to a community hospital and residents in these long-term care facilities in Northeast Ohio, with the exception of a patient who was transferred to a tertiary medical center from Qatar. So the question is, how did it get to Northeast Ohio? Did it come from overseas or did poor soul who came from Qatar get it from the long term um, who was transferred from the tertiary medical center from Qatar? Remember, this was um, under the, the guidance uh, of, of the VA. And so 
you know, it, it, it really, you know, goes to speaking about um, this whole emerging discipline of, of the resistome. Uh, we remember we did a twim on, on the resistome when we talked about Hazel's paper about the cave microbes having drug resistance and how they acquire this information. Mm -hmm. Elio's blog, Small Kings Considered in 2012, also discussed uh, the resistome. And so how these microbes are acquiring uh, this new information is, is really uh, – pretty interesting. And so uh, the gene array in this particular class one integron is almost identical, they say, to that of another pseudomonas isolate characterized from an outbreak in Chicago at Cook County Hospital. And this is a, another same genetic element was detected in Norway in Pseudomonas ST233 that was found to have been imported from Ghana. And so as Vincent and Michelle were talking in the beginning about Ebola not being able to get a foothold in this country because of how our approach to medicine, this is not necessarily the case with this particular antibiotic resistance integron that's just moving across mm. the globe without any resistance. We're fortunate, though, that Pseudomonas aeruginosa um, in general is an opportunistic pathogen, which means those of us whose um, barriers are intact can be exposed to Pseudomonas, but we won't become ill. So that's very different from Ebola, which is a primary pathogen. Correct. And, and that is the principal reason, I think, why it's of such importance to the folks in in this research group because a lot of them were from uh, major medical centers and um, the Veterans Medical Affairs System, which have a lot of patients who are transported in and then have other existing comorbidities that make them opportunistic uh, patients where pseudomonas can actually attack them more easily than you or I. Right. If they have a, a catheter, for example, or a um, an IV, something that's pierced their skin w would be an opportunity for pseudomonas to uh, gain a foothold. So to speak. This fellow mm -hmm. had it in his foot, right? Yeah, right. this foot had it in his foot, <laughs> but he also had a UTI at the same time. And he was diabetic. Yeah. That's probably another... Right. Oh, sure. The neutrophils yeah, his, don't his, work so well. Yeah. The neutrophils don't work so well. Your urine is a little bit sweeter. And, um, you know, it reminds me of that bad episode of House where he's always tasting urine to see if it's sweet or not. Hmm. So, you know, this paper was, um, as they say, a bread and butter epidemiologic tour of force. But I thought it would was worthwhile for the TWIM audience because it introduces some neat techniques you can actually do in the lab yourself without fancy machines, namely um, the modified assays, and you can also do the e-test yeah. relatively. Yeah, it's very really old-fashioned petri dish work, isn't it? Yeah, and it ties Amazing. into the molecular biology. And, and I also was intrigued by uh, this repetitive PCR technique um, because pulse field is extremely challenging, you need a special instrument. But repetitive PCR, most modern laboratories, whether they be research or teaching, has a, a PCR machine in that. And you can get the primers fairly easily for these repetitive sequences. And it'll give you a particular pattern when you plot out the number of bands that you have and, and the amount of bands that you have. And... You know, so you can actually do some low-tech, high-tech type of work to figure out an outbreak. And, you know, one of ASM's goals is, is to bring diagnostic microbe to the emerging world. And this is something that is easily done. So, um, you know, right. everything from teaching hospitals to the, the casual undergraduate laboratory can ask the question, you know, what are we seeing? And you know, some of these things are, are really uh, pretty neat, neat to do. Thank you, Michael. 
All right, let me wrap up with a couple of emails. Uh, we have one from Tom who writes, Hi, Twim, Twiv, and Twip Argonauts. Your three wonderful <laughs> podcasts are the nutrient media for growing my scientific knowledge. <laughs> I have been downloading them from iTunes for a couple of years, and although as a mere amateur, I sometimes struggle to keep up with the content, I've never listened to a single one that did not teach me something significant that I can understand. The workload to keep up is heavy, but I've never fallen behind more than a few weeks. Well, I'm a couple of months behind on TWIP. I even listen to them for an hour or so at night before I fall asleep, and the mellifluous guidance of Dr. <laughs> Rack and Yellow helps me knit up the raveled sleeve. Oh, wow. Ooh, I guess, beautiful. I guess I put them to sleep, huh? You do, you do. <laughs> this morning, probably blame me for that. This morning, while on the treadmill at the gym, I listened to another very different kind of science podcast, the UK Guardian's This Week in Science, June 20th. It was entirely devoted to a very interesting discussion of the six possible challenges for the 2014 UK Longitude Prize, celebrating 300 years since the original prize for the invention of the chronometer to determine longitude at sea, including one that was based on the rise of worldwide antimicrobial resistance, so familiar to your listeners. The public was asked to vote to select one of the six possible challenges for the $10 million pound sterling prize, and yesterday the result was announced. The voters picked the challenge to create a cheap, accurate, rapid, and easy-to-use point-of-care test kit for bacterial infections. Wow. Jeez. Gee, and I hadn't even read that. So That's I'm great. Put the link for that. That's cool. I was particularly interested in the discussion between the UK's chief medical officer, Dame Sally Davies, and Dr. Emily Grossman, educator, broadcaster, and expert in molecular biology. It seems that finding a cheap, quick, and easy way for GPs and other medical practitioners in out-of-the-way places like desert communities is needed to enable them to on-the-site determine whether an illness is viral or bacterial. This would allow them to stop treating with antibiotics, which continuous and increasing use, of course, contributes to the resistance problem. I understand there has been some recent progress in developing a better laboratory test for this purpose, but the quick, cheap, easy black box is still elusive. I thought you might be interested in this and maybe some of your listeners too. I should think there may be a potential winner of the prize among them. So as so far as I know, competition is not limited to UK people and I think there's going to be a five-year period allowed for entry and submission of a solution. I hadn't been aware of this prize and it seems a great way to encourage and stimulate discovery and innovation outside of the academic and corporate institutions. Thank you again for all the work you do to make the world a little more scientifically literate. Weather in Sausalito, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge at 3 p.m. is typical for our summer's wind from the west. 20 knots clear with fog ready to roll in over the hills behind us. Temperature in the 70s Fahrenheit, barometer 29.92, humidity 55%. In one word, spectacular. <laughs> or maybe, as Elia would say, peachy. <laughs> that was a spectacular email, Tom. Thank you. That's wow. That's very nice. So this is a cool, you got five years to, to win 10 million pounds. Make a, a rapid uh, point of care test. Robin writes, mentee, one of, my for, one of the mentees of my former graduate student, mentor, protege. Okay, so he's defining that for us. Gives a link to that. Scrubs, a separate distinctive color should be reserved for surgical scrubs. No entry or exit from restricted areas wearing scrubs should be permitted. Each area requiring scrubs should use a distinctive color and enforce the same policy. No distinctive colored scrubs should be permitted in areas that do not require them. This needs to be enforced through federal regulations. Many hospitals will be reluctant to annoy their surgeons, the geese that lay so many of the golden eggs for them. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about scrubs. I always see people walking around the streets in scrubs, which it's absurd. They leave an infection control area and then go outside. On buses, on subways. Mike, Michael, you, you, you're the expert. We did that yeah. one paper on, you know, the yeah. inverse square of yeah, uh, right. drug-resistant right. bugs. Brooklyn, right? In Brooklyn. A that, tree grows in Brooklyn. Yeah, he's right. They should enforce it, but they're afraid to, to annoy the surgeons, right? It's all about time because time requires that they change their clothes and it's about a facility to change their clothes in. They don't want to devote the space to locker rooms and yeah. it's all about billable square footage you That's have right. to be square footage what billable can you bill for I like that. <laughs> <laughs> john writes dear ph balanced hosts hmm. it was 22 degrees celsius in the air but more importantly the ph 
was 10 under my feet. I was at the shore of Mono Lake, wondering, oh, nice, wondering why thermophile, face. acidophile, extremophiles get all the publicity. See TWIV 195, they did it in the hot tub, for example. What sort of microbes live in cool to cold alkaline lakes? I know algae grows there because that is mm-hmm. the larval diet of the alkali flies that breed in huge numbers. Unfortunately, I was too early for peak fly season. And so I looked this up, and there is uh, there are quite a few microbes that live in cool alkaline lakes, and we'll put a link to that. Um, but uh, things like... Habmonas, Amphibacillus, Halo Natronum, Halo Alkaphilic, Archaea, etc. So there, it's been studied. Uh, so there you go. Cool alkaline lakes. And now we can drop instrumentation and collect their RNA and see what they're sure. doing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and over time, absolutely. Yeah. Just need a half a million dollars for one right. of those things. And a boat, a boat or a ship. That or a ship. That won't come apart in the alkaline, right? Yeah. Jim writes, I'm biased towards single topic discussions because they provide hooks and are easier to file and retrieve from a blog that is now a living encyclopedic book with the amazing and imaginative title, Podcast Encyclopedia. I've stuffed a few twiv, twim, and twips into titles that pointed at a key topic and then let listeners discover the related material. All of your episodes are astounding nonfiction with too many hooks to use as a title. And because of that, I leave them out. <laughs> mm. Ouch. My solution is to suggest single topic podcasts. Easy to say, of course. Just thought I'd make the pitch for single mindedness in case anyone wants to suggest another approach. Also wanted to ask about all the presentations at each ASM conference and how some have better attendance. Does high attendance suggest importance? If so, is there a way to get the list of topics for each? Might be useful notes for a podcast. 9,000 people might be a ma- must be a madhouse. What a challenge for a robotics class. Create a group of drones you could disperse for simultaneous <laughs> attendance at all the presentations you want to cover. Uh, though, it seems to me that the the uh, meeting, the ASM talks that get the most attendance are the ones by either people who are really well-known or really hot topics, right? Yeah, sure. principally. Right. Like when Michelle gives a talk, the room is packed. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's it's hard to know if... if um, we hear kind of the birth announcement of a subject. It, there yeah. may not be that many people in the know, but three years from now, we'll look back and, and re- recognize how yeah. important that right. was. So, you know, but, I, I wonder whether uh, we, we, we have two topics usually. Yeah. Is that such a large number? I mean, one is smaller than two, but two is a small number. It's not like we have a half a dozen. So yeah, I'm not sure. Two. I'm I would so agree sure with that Jim so that it would bad. be very helpful if we had a few keywords that got um, put into each episode show notes so that we could search them more easily. Well, we do put keywords in for the post um, on microworld.org. So and then we can search it yeah, and so find them that way? Okay. It depends on me coming up with the keywords, you know. Which All right, I, so I, I try we're to, on it, Jim. I try to do that, yeah. Well, there's a simple way of doing it. We typically pick two papers and there are keywords in the abstract. So if we just lift the key words out of the abstracts of the yeah. two papers that we discuss, work. you'll have them. Yep. That's true. I, I will also say to Jim that um, ASM does make um, presentations available. You can, you can purchase access to them right. um, through the ASM website. Right. That's, so that uh, you can go back and watch a presentation that you were unable to attend. Yep, they do. You just, I think you go to asm.org, you can find that. I believe so. All right, one more from Don who writes, Dear Twimmers, I listened with interest to your discussion of the ASM annual meeting. As a food microbiologist, I feel compelled to point out that an expert panel recommends not rewashing bagged salad. Of course, as microbiologists, you may be better than the general public about cross-contamination in the kitchen. That's interesting. So he sends a link to... Uh, paper out of UC Davis. Fresh cut leafy green salads, recommendations. And they say not to re- rewash them. Even if you're going to eat it right away? Yeah, it says it doesn't. The panel oh, advised yeah. that additional washing is re- is not likely to enhance safety. Risk of cross-contamination may outweigh any safety benefits. So they're saying that you're likely to contaminate it with something else. 
No, I, I wash it, I spin it, it goes right into the salad bowl. Yeah, as he said, you as a microbiologist are probably better than the right, general public. Right, right, But I would always wash it because after hearing that talk at, at the uh, GM, mm-hmm. uh, forget it. I, I, oh, yeah. Bag salad, <laughs> spinach is like one of the biggest rising causes of uh, infections now from food. Anyway, he says, if you ever want to chat with a food microbiologist on the podcast, I'm available. I co-host a microbial food safety podcast called Food Safety Talk. Good for you. I also have a strong ASM connection. I've been an editor for Applied and Environmental Microbiology for almost 10 years. I was elected an AAM fellow this year, although I had to leave the annual meeting before the induction ceremony because I'm also president of the International Association for Food Protection, and we had a board meeting that week. Oh, so Don is a professor at Rutgers. What a privilege to have you as part of our audience, Don. Well, we should, I'd love to have a food microbiologist. Yeah, that would on, be a cool one. Because we don't know much. I don't know anything about food microbiology. You could argue with him about lettuce. I, I do know. We wash it. All I know is that cheese is really good. <laughs> I love and it. And wine. Full of microbes. Wine and many other things. All right, that is TWIM85. You'll find it at iTunes and also at Microbe World dot org slash twim and we love reading your questions and comments you can send them to twim at twiv dot tv michelle swanson is at the university of michigan thank you michelle thank you i'll see you next time you bet alio Schechter is at small things considered thank you alio my pleasure michael schmidt is at the medical university of south carolina thank you michael thank you, thank you vincent and I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for supporting TWIM, and in particular, Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Right. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs> uh, what was this? At the beginning, you guys were talking about a bloom of cyano something in a lake. Yeah, what, what, what's Toledo. That the whole lake city Erie. was on a alert. They couldn't use the water for and a couple of days. They couldn't even boil it. No, it was a week. Uh, uh, what was it in the... Was it? It was a toxin. It's it cyanobacteria? A, yeah. yeah it was a, no, it was dinoflagellates. Red, dinoflagellates. It was, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. It is cyanobacteria. <laughs> Or is it that a flash? It's not mixed up. I thought it was cyanobacterium, but I... I, just I think you're right. Oh, yeah, here we go. Cyanobacteria are far from Tule- just Toledo's problem. Okay. I wanted to... Yeah, anyhow. It's, Actually, it, it made the New York Times. Yeah. Ooh. Wow, that's pretty intense. All right. All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks, sure Yep, it was good.